We'll be starting momentarily. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim Fink, and I'm Policy Director for American Farmland Trust. I want to first thank you for joining us here today. We know that between the hearing, the policy priority deadlines, this is an especially busy time for all of you. So really appreciate you being here with us today. In case you're not familiar, American Farmland Trust, we're an organization focused on three mission areas, land, practices, and people. This means protecting agricultural land, promoting sound practices on farm and ranch land, and ensuring that the people who steward the land have viable businesses without which no other part of our mission is possible. Today's webinar is focused on a specific farm bill policy opportunity, namely a federal matching program for state and soil health programs. However, I would note that this is just one part of what AFT is working on in this farm bill. We're also advancing other policies in conservation as well as farmland protection, uh, farmland access, farm viability, particularly in the form of business technical assistance for farm and food businesses. Andrew Berenberg on our team is working on business technical assistance and farmland access. Chris Coffis is also working on farmland access as well as leading on farmland protection. Before I turn the microphone over, I wanted to make a few housekeeping notes. First, this is a meeting that is being recorded so that it can be shared with others who could not attend today. Second, please feel free to type in questions throughout the presentation. We may not answer them until the Q&A portion of this presentation, but it's great to have them in advance. With that, I want to introduce Samantha Levy, AFT's Conservation and Climate Policy Manager, who will be leading this webinar. Samantha? Thank you so much, Tim, and welcome all. Um, so we're gonna begin with a really quick poll to learn uh, where y'all are coming from. We can get a sense of who's in the room, so if you could just, on your screen, you'll see question, and uh, just go ahead and click your answer. We'll keep this open for another few seconds so we can get a sense of who's in the room with us today. All right. And Emily, if we're looking like we've got a lot of folks, yeah, if you can share the results. Excellent. Great, so it looks like we've got about a third of folks here today are coming from a house office, welcome. Um, and then many from Senate offices, uh, from state agencies, from nonprofits, and some farmers and ranchers. So yeah, know y'all are so busy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really, really appreciate your time. So I and this distinguished panel that will be joining me in just a moment are here today to talk about three topics that are near and dear to my heart, soil health, farm viability, and state and local leadership. And Emily, if you're sharing screen, we can't quite see it yet. And Tom, I, you can wait for a moment. I've, I'll, I'll speak for five minutes and then perfect. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Okay, so um, next slide, please. For those that are newer to farming or to soil health, I just wanted to take a moment to talk about what it means and what soil health practices are. So what you're seeing here is a graphic from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And basically these are the four principles that all add up together um, when followed to improve soil health on a farm or ranch. And that would be to minimize disturbance. So that's things like reducing tillage, um, maximize biodiversity that can look like integrating livestock in with crop production or diversifying crop rotation or even planting cover crops maximizing soil cover and maximizing living roots throughout the year and all these followed really add up to improved soil health on a farm or ranch uh, books so soil health is one of those topics that really bring people together and enjoys broad and widespread support. From Republicans to Democrats, from farmers to environmentalists. For instance, all the groups you see below have banded together to support soil health in their farm bill recommendations. These are the logos of the Steering Committee of the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance, or FACA. And that, go, that spans from American Farm Bureau Federation to the Environmental Defense Fund to National Association of State Departments of Agriculture. And isn't that cool? You know, books have been written about soil health. Movies have been made about it. Why? Why has soil health so captured our collective imagination? 
Well, to me, it's really no surprise because soil health has so many benefits for individual farms and ranches and for communities. Improving soil health stabilizes yields, reduces erosion, increases water holding capacity to build resilience to droughts and floods that are becoming increasingly more common across the country, and soil health supports farm viability. In fact, AFT's soil health case studies that we've done show an average return on investment of $3 for every dollar spent adopting soil health practices on the farm. Soil health practices also improve water quality for the surrounding community and can even mitigate climate change by sequestering carbon in the soil. And soil health has even been shown to reduce federal program costs. A recent study showed that a 1% increase in soil organic matter, a key soil health indicator, was linked to a 30 to 40% reduction in crop insurance payouts under drought conditions. Amazing. But adoption of soil health practices is not yet really widespread. Data on practice adoption is limited, but the data we do have shows that there's great potential for improvement here. Um, for example, as of 2017, only 6% of eligible acres were planted with cover crops. Why is that? Farmers are working really hard, you know, to feed their communities, to feed their families, to build viable businesses, and it can be costly. It can have extra costs added to adopt soil health practices, including purchasing new equipment. That's a key barrier we've heard from farmers across the country who don't have the right equipment. It can seem risky or it can be risky to deviate from tried and true practices, especially during that transition period where you're trying something new um, before a practice takes hold. There can also be a lack of trusted support or the right kind of information for farmers and ranchers to feel like they really have the roadmap to know what to do. And insecure land tenure can have a sort of cooling effect on adoption of new practices that pay off longer term. Now, luckily, we have a suite of programs funded in the Farm Bill in Title II and administered through NRCS, like EQIP, CSP, and RCPP, that provide some really strong science-based support to overcome these barriers. But these programs, they leave gaps. AFT's own research and uh, general research shows that these programs are oversubscribed. And on the next slide, you'll see a graphic that depicts that between 2010 and 2020, EQIP was only able to fund 30% of applications. These programs also don't support equipment purchase. They can be onerous to apply for, and they aren't always tailored to local conditions and needs. But luckily, in recent years, states have been rushing in to create and fund new programs and build on long-standing water quality programs and efforts to fill these gaps and invest in helping producers adopt soil health practices in locally tailored ways that meet their needs. And now if my um, panelists, my fellow panelists can uh, come on camera, we're here today to hear from three states about how they're stepping up to lead and help producers in their states voluntarily adopt soil health practices. Um, but three things to know before we get into this panel. We could hear from so many different states on this topic. Today we only have time for three, but I'll share some examples throughout of other, other approaches and innovations that states are doing. I also want to make it clear that the folks that are joining us that you see on screen are not here endorsing any particular policy, but instead they're here to provide information. And then finally, after the panel and before we get to your questions, I'm going to um, make a real quick Farm Bill connection. So just reminding folks to please, as we go through this panel, put your questions into the question box. And then without further ado, I'm gonna ask my panelists starting from east to west, so Pennsylvania, Indiana, Minnesota, to please introduce yourselves, your name, your title, your agency, and then really briefly, can you talk about why it's important to you and your agency to support producers in adopting soil health practices? Doug, let's start with you. Good afternoon, Samantha. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for your leadership to American Farmland Trust and to my uh, panelists from other states. But 
Uh, yes, yeah, soil health. So we hear a lot about uh, why soil health is important. And I can tell you that, you know, from Pennsylvania's perspective, uh, it matters a lot. Soil is a vital living ecosystem that sustains us all. Uh, we've invested a whole lot of money in preserving farmland in Pennsylvania, uh, over 600,000 acres and 6,200 farms at this point, uh, and just really looking to uh, further provide opportunities for producers in the area of soil health for all the reasons Samantha mentioned, uh, keeping the, the principles of keeping the soil covered with cover crops, minimizing disturbance through no-till, encouraging the growth of the microorganisms and restore, restore the soil health through those practices, uh, the living roots, which have the ability to capture carbon and suck it into the soil and allow it to, uh, uh, you know, help with with feed soil biology. Uh, crop diversity as well is important with uh, being able to have a, a variety of species that, uh, like oats, radish, buckwheat, clover, vetch, for example, uh, that provide biodiversity and stimulate growth of organisms. Uh, and then also, if applicable, integrate livestock into those uh, practices as well so that uh, microbial communities flourish that way. But uh, just in terms of why it matters, I, we have a lot of conservation initiatives right now in Pennsylvania, and it uh, really comes down to soil health. So uh, whether it protects water quality, whether it provides habitat, whether it uh, improves the environment in other ways, uh, it really comes down to soil health and regenerative farming practices and would really like to see you know additional opportunities for producers in that area. But thank you for allowing me to be part of the panel today. Thank you so much for joining us, Doug. Jen. Good morning, afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to be on the panel. Um, so I'm Jennifer Thumb. I'm with the State Department of Agriculture in Indiana, specifically with the Division of Soil Conservation. Um, so we're the, there's 43 of us, I think, in the Division of Soil Conservation. So great question um, regarding on soil health and why it's important to Indiana. So for Indiana, agriculture is vital to our state's economy. We grow a lot of things in Indiana, from tomatoes to corn, to mitt, to ducks, to sheep, to alpacas. Um, we have a lot going on. Um, and so a lot of those don't take a lot of time to grow, but when you look at organic matter soil, it takes a while to grow that. So it's very important that we take care of what we have. Also, Indiana is unique in that we've got the top half of our straight state drains to the Great Lakes, which is a phosphorus concern that's creating those algal blooms. And then they also drains to the Gulf of the Mississippi, which is the nitrogen concern. So soil health is very important for our state and our division. Um, so we really work with the landowners to make sure that as they transition from conventional to a strip till, no-till system, that they have that support. It's not, a, it's not easy to make that transition and it's not cheap. There's a lot of data, there's a lot of experts out there. It's really, you can get lost. So it's really important for us to help the farmers, our, our farmers find that transition easy and to ask questions and to really feel that they are engaged in the process. So we really support them from the very beginning, um, you know, cover crops to go to filter strips to make that transition. Um, but it's also very important for us to make sure their bottom line isn't negatively impacted as that mm -hmm. makes the transition and for them to be successful. Because if they're successful, they're going to tell their neighbor and the whole system is just keep rolling down the hill. So thank yeah. you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jen. And now I'll invite um, my friends from Minnesota. Go ahead, Brad. Okay, I'm sorry. Brad Rodal Redland. I'm uh, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. I manage a couple of programs here that I'll certainly be highlighting today our Minnesota Agriculture Water Quality Certification Program and our Soil, and, uh, soil Health Financial Assistance Pilot Program. Um, when we talk about the importance of soil health to our state and to the work in our agency, um, I'll, I'll go right to the mission of our agency and I'll, I'll read our mission, we'll employ our mission. And that it is to enhance all Minnesotans' quality of life by equitably ensuring the integrity of our food system and the health of our environment and the strength and resiliency of our agricultural economy. Now, those of you who work in soil health know a little bit about it. Soil health is addressing all of components of that mission when you're talking about just maintaining a viable agricultural industry and maintaining that production year in, year out. Obviously, the environmental benefits and then certainly the, the benefits of the food system and a reliable supply and a resilient supply. Soil health is key to all that. Um, 
it's important to our state, it's important to our agency for all the partnerships we do. We really prioritize partnerships in our work and in our state. We um, and in the creation of um, guiding plans that we have from the nutrient management plan, our Gulf hypoxia commitments uh, to our climate action framework we developed recently uh, in our state and are now promoting. Um, Groundwater Protection Act in our in our uh, agency's uh, portfolio. Um, soil health is the one unifying element that will address all of these issues from the, like I say, from a climate action framework to a groundwater concern to uh, health hypoxia. Um, soil health mm -hmm. is clearly where we're going to direct our efforts. So, Tom. Tom. Thanks, Brad. Uh, my name is Tom Guile with the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources. Um, our state agency's sort of niche in the realm of conservation work in Minnesota is primarily working uh, through local organizations and private landowners and implementing conservation on private lands. Uh, as the, the state soil and water conservation agency, um, a lot of our primary objectives fall into the same niche and sort of the plans and objectives that, that Brad referred to only again, it's kind of the delivery mechanism maybe varies a little bit more. Um, I would play off of a little bit what Brad said in referencing a number of those plans. When you look in Minnesota, at the nutrient reduction strategies, the sediment reduction strategies, and the climate action frameworks that we have in Minnesota. Many of those plans refer to various soil health management systems and practices in terms of millions of acres that need to be implemented in order to obtain those goals. Um, when we have over 28 million acres of agricultural land in the state, millions of acres is still a sizable chunk of that in order to get where, where we feel we need to be as a state. But it's also really important really important to recognize the importance of all the individual landowners who may need to incorporate these various things or may want to incorporate these various things into their operations and their systems. Um, we can't do this sustainably by simply paying for it. It needs to be done in ways that that support landowner decisions on their farms, on their acres. Soil health is it may, may be tied to broad big picture goals but soil health is a very, very local thing that is worked on by the people who, who own and operate those lands. And so it's really important um, for, for us in Minnesota, uh, across all of our agency efforts, to do things in a way that, that both work towards the goals that we may have, but also work towards whatever the landowner and operator's goals are and find ways that works for them in order to be sustainable long term. Great. Thank you, Tom. Hopefully y'all can hear me. I just got a message that my audio may drag. So let me know um, if, if you can't. Thank you so much um, all for answering that question. Inspiring start to the panel. Um, and now I'll ask each of you to take a few minutes to explain what programs you're implementing at your state agencies to support adoption of soil health practices to meet these goals that you outlined. And if you can also touch on how they complement or build on NRCS programs, and then share any information about um, program popularity with producers you work with, even if you're experiencing any oversubscription like NRCS programs. And we'll start with um, Indiana and then move to Minnesota and then Pennsylvania. Okay, thanks. You mixed up the order. I was like, oh. <laughs> on my toe with Samantha, I love it. <laughs> so for Indiana, our Division of Soil Conservation, we administer the Clean Water Indiana Fund under the direction of our state soil board. So to give you a little bit of background, the cigarette, the CWI budget is derived from a portion of our cigarette tax fund. So the cigarette tax fund is 4.22% of total cigarette tax revenue. Our Clean Water Indiana budget receives one sixth of that amount. So in recent years, the CWI, of course, has received general appropriations as well, um, but then it's gotten cut a little bit. So um, typically our state programs to support the soil health, as I mentioned, the Clean Water Indiana, we have a competitive process, a grant process, that where the 92 soil and water conservation districts, which are the local level, can apply for grants for cover crops, filter strips, invasive species, to really to promote the soil health um, and those complement NRCS programs. A lot of them partner with their local um, district conservationists. Um, and those usually, if 
the local district has a cost share. They can actually have equipment modification, which is Samantha mentioned, is not something that NRCS can do. And that money goes quick. Um, that's definitely one of our stronger programs that we have. Also, um, Indiana is very fortunate. We have two regional conservation partnership program, which is the RCPP. We have one for the Western Lake Erie Basin, which is partnership with Michigan and Ohio. We also have one in the Kankakee, which is partnering with the state of Illinois. These, of course, are definitely promote soil health partnerships. Um, I'm a big fan of these. They promote community awareness as well. Get, as they put conservation on the ground, they really help tell the story at that local community level of the good work that our producers are doing for the conservation. Another program that we have is CREP, so Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. This is administered by the Farm Service Agency, FSA, another really good partner for us. So our state soil board appropriates about 600,000 annually to help do promote the native trees, vegetation on converted cropland. Um, the Nature Conservancy is another big partner for us. Um, and recently Caterpillar, the company has been helping with us as well. Um, Another program that we started a couple years ago um, is a cover crop discount program that is working with our risk, the RMA, risk management. So as we know, cover crops are a great, they can help prevent erosion, improve water quality, making soils resilient to weather and those climate impacts. So this is really another program and they complement NRCS as well. Um, another unique program that we have is we, in recent years, have been offering free soil sampling it's always been our in a lot of if you don't if you don't know it and you, if you're not testing you don't know it so how much nutrients are actually in your soil so we want to encourage our producers to test the soil rather than just broad um put on their fertilizer so we're mm -hmm. really encourage them to test it and we've been able to offer that free um and then also we, we have been working with our local um, co-ops and retailers for them and, and incentivizing them to work with their producers as well to test that soil um, those are the programs that we have, Samantha. Thank you, Jen. Uh, a wide a wide swath of very innovative work. Um, appreciate you taking the time to run that down. And I'll also point out before we get to Minnesota that um, both Iowa and Illinois also implement a cover crop discount through RMA with crop insurance. And um, that provides a $5 per acre premium discount for folks that plant cover crops. And I'll just point out that in Illinois, every year that this program has been in existence, funding has been fully expended within hours of opening that funding up, making this program to help plant cover crops arguably as hot as a Taylor Swift concert. Um, but happily, it's way less expensive. <laughs> um, beginning four years ago in Illinois, they had a little over $300,000 to support cover crop planting on 50,000 acres. Funding has tripled since then, but they still have 20,000 acres that they weren't able to fund in the last round. And Jen, I, I see you nodding, so it sounds like you're experiencing the sim a similar level of oversubscription and interest. Oh, absolutely. It's only in select counties, unfortunately, and we'll get angry phone calls, which understandably, right? But yeah, it's gone. It's a great program. Yeah, thanks, Jen. All right, great. Um, Brad and Tom, please. Okay, well, I'll go then. I'll uh, I'll just concentrate on two programs right now at the state. Um, I mentioned them already: the Minnesota Agriculture Water Quality Certification Program. This is a, a whole farm assessment program that we do, uh, obviously with water quality as, as our central goal. But uh, every every conservation concept comes along for the ride, as as we all know here: wildlife habitat, um, air pollution, everything. I mean, soil conservation. Um, uh, it's all going to lead to. Uh, um, the multiple impacts that we're also uh, eager to achieve. The program or, um, seeks soil health as you know the unifying element to obtain that certification through our through our our project, of, which is again it's a risk assessment. Go on every parcel, every crop grown, every point in the rotation, and just see you know where a challenge may exist. And uh, when you start introducing soil health practices, you're using some strip till, you're using some cover crops, you're uh, setting up some grazing, introducing livestock in your system. These are all elements that are gonna have all of those multiple benefits. They're what we do. And they are, uh, importantly, as has been discussed already today, they're very site specific and they're very individualized. It's, you're working with that ground you're standing on and that producer who is managing it 
to determine how best to implement these practices with soil health management in, into their system. And your stand, and we have our certifiers to stand with them as a free consultant, <laughs> walks that path with them every step of the way, is always at the end of the phone uh, through a 10 year certification process and is um, again, just available to them throughout this process. So we have about 1300, well, we have more than 1300 farms enrolled right now. That's very close to, not, to uh, 1 million acres certified under these 10 year contracts where we know those commitments are being maintained. Um, we've had two RCPP agreements or very proud to have earned to support our work. Um, that will be $18 million total that we have brought to the state, um, strictly in the form of financing for our partners and our growers. Um, we don't take actually any of those RCPP dollars. We have to turn those all into practices. Um, and we have um, other partnerships uh, through local soil and water conservation districts. I mm. should mention them at the lead. They are the uh, life's blood, the spinal column of our work through the counties and the districts throughout the state. Um, we certainly uh, are not limited in anything. What we're out there doing in our certification program is, again, finding the risks and then finding any means available to, to mitigate those risks. So we have a, a $5,000 program of our uh, grant program internally of our own that just kind of hit spots that other programs miss. <laughs> but we do over half a million dollars of that, 5,000 or less at a time, primarily with cover crops, fencing, that sort of thing, do those soil health beneficial practices. Um, Lots of equip contracts, lots of CSP, CRP signups, CREP enrollments, all these things uh, are what people are utilizing to obtain that certification and are utilizing across the state, even aside from certification, of course. Um, the uh, uh, other one I guess I really want to mention was our new pilot, that soil health equipment grant. So this is specifically for um, what was identified clearly as an obstacle to adopting the soil health practices. Uh, you're buying a, a full size strip till machine, you're investing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, even if you're buying a used no-till drill or you're retrofitting a high boy into a cover crop cedar, uh, it's all expense. And it's all uh, essentially ineligible for other forms of financial support largely. Um, and that was identified uh, statewide um, from the individual growers that would call us and say, hey, can we get some money to do these retrofitting or to buy a piece of equipment? So you actually, you know, NRCS rules and stuff don't allow that. We can't give you money for those purposes. But so our legislature last session said, let's do a pilot program. We'll put out $500,000, uh, set that up for a two year grant program to actually finance the equipment purchases or retrofitting equipment, buy parts and materials to retrofit equipment. Um, uh, well, let's see how that goes. Well, uh, we opened up. Uh, that RFP in uh, late January, it's running through next week. Um, in two weeks time, we had doubled what was available. Now we're well over four times in applications, uh, what's available for funding. And, um, you know, a lot of the serious ones haven't happened yet because they wait till the deadline. <laughs> so we're clearly uh, oversubscribed on that one. Uh, it's mm -hmm. clearly something that um, we're somewhat standing alone on in the sense that, you know, there just really are other areas for that. But uh, I'm proud to say that, uh, Egg industry in our state, whether it's you know our industry leaders like uh, CHS or General Mills or Cargill uh, have really expressed interest in advancing the soil health, or it's our egg, agricultural organizations, including uh, our corn growers, our pork producers, uh, our farmers union, our farm bureau. There uh, have actually formed uh, a bit of a coalition and have introduced legislation this session to give as much as $10 million. <laughs> Mm -hmm. in an annual appropriation for this equipment grants because they know the demand is out there so we're, that that is yet to happen obviously that's we the legislature will determine that um but um it's a evidence of the uh, demand that's out there not already just in the applications but in the desire for more so yeah, let me stop there and turn it over to tom please tom thanks brad thank you um so a couple of connections that that we have uh through our work is we have Put a sizable investment in trying to leverage our existing one watershed one plan sort of comprehensive watershed management framework in minnesota those plans are driven by local entities counties soil and water conservation districts and watershed districts um, with significant input from from local landowners producers and, and just residents and citizens uh, to inform what are the local priorities for conservation delivery uh, within those watershed areas um, so most of the work that we've done to date has really been tied towards trying to leverage that effort at the local level to talk about where they want to try and implement things, um, which has led to 
I think some also sort of general direction towards water quality historically as being kind of a primary goal for much of the work, again, tying back to some of the plans that were referenced in our earlier comments. Um, for our programming, just three to four years ago, we had the first time where we had set aside dedicated funding for soil health purposes at $1 million from our state's clean water fund um, to deliver conservation practices tied towards uh, cover crops specifically in that initiative. Um, over the last biennium, we received a $1 million appropriation from our general fund and $4 million from our clean water fund um, to go towards soil health practice adoption. Um, a, a little bit more specifically, again, focused towards drinking water protection, public water supply type efforts, again, trying to be specific. Um, I think that's been very positive in terms of being focused about the, the accomplishments that we're trying to do. But I think there's also recognition that generally speaking, if we need millions of acres of, you know, cover crops, no-till, strip-till and soil health related practices in Minnesota, being so narrowly focused is going to be challenging for us to, to really leverage that going forward. Um, yeah, we've been absolutely. typically, we've been typically sort of set up towards leveraging um, federal funding as sort of a niche fill and being able to fill in different areas where the, the state money can help bring that in along the way um, and pushing for the, the soil and water conservation districts to work with landowners. I think uh, as a segue towards the, the next question and kind of wrapping up to we're really fortunate in Minnesota and what we're expecting for potential future legislation as Brad mentioned in appropriations. Um, so I think we're on the edge of being at sort of a, an, an earth shattering movement in Minnesota to invest in soil health practices. And we wanna position ourselves well to leverage federal funding wherever we can. Um, I would just implore the decision makers involved in that process to think about making it easy to deliver that. Mm -hmm. um, whatever that looks like, however we can leverage that money, we have opportunity to do so, but the mechanics of getting it to the local level through the state agencies or just period to the local level is really, really critical to make it make it easy to deliver. Yeah, great, great point, um, Tom, absolutely. And Doug, bring us home, um, help yeah, us understand what today is so doing. So Matt, yeah, so just for some additional context, Pennsylvania, as you know, is in the Chesapeake Bay watershed and Pennsylvania farmers have for a long time been under a lot of pressure to clean up the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, these goals are outlined in what we call the Watershed Implementation Plan 3, uh, which says that we have to reduce uh, nitrogen pollution by 34.13 million pounds of, uh, of nitrogen uh, in order to meet those goals by 2025. Uh, and approximately 70 or 80% of those reductions within Pennsylvania fall within the ag sector. Uh, we have 43 counties and 49,000 miles of streams in the Bay watershed. Uh, but certainly, and it's been mentioned several times, you know, the goals of uh, the Chesapeake Bay and the goals of water quality are related to soil health. And in fact, in this watershed implementation plan three, uh, there are seven key factors or strategic areas that the EPA points out uh, that we'll need to focus on and the second one listed is soil health second or third uh, so it's called out in that watershed implementation plan in response to that the pennsylvania general assembly this past year created a new program that's administered by my office the state conservation commission called the agricultural conservation assistance program uh, providing pretty significant funding uh, through our state clean streams fund uh, for best management practices on farms uh, and, you know, with a real emphasis here on not just the structural type practices like manure storages and concrete barnyards, but also the agronomic practices that, uh, you know, very clearly in nutrient management practices, which very clearly align with soil health. Uh, so we see this as a real opportunity to build more momentum and more leverage. Uh, we have groups, uh, you know, talking about momentum. We have the Soil Health Coalition and the No-Till Alliance that has winter meetings. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, and I attended those meetings back in January, uh, and they were packed with farmers who were interested in doing soil health and learning about cover crops and sharing their experiences. Uh, you know, it makes sense on so many different levels for producers, but also sharing their experiences on why it makes sense from a profitability standpoint, increased profits, decreased cost of inputs, open up new market opportunities in some cases with this public-private partnership. We have uh, a couple examples of that and traceability, uh, you know, which I think with regenerative agriculture, soil health, uh, 
environment in general will have a, a bigger uh, market opportunity for producers in the future. Uh, a lot of young farmers in Pennsylvania, I think we have the highest percentage of farmers under the age of 35. Uh, and I really see this momentum with, you know, this younger generation who's perhaps looking to further improve on the conservation investment on their farms. Uh, so I think the timing is just right. The momentum is right. I think, you know, the, the funding that we're investing in this new ACAP program and working with uh, 66 county conservation districts across the state to implement this work, uh, it's just right to really, you know, further emphasize soil health. Uh, in these discussions and priorities. That's one program. We have another one that was provided under the Pennsylvania Farm Bill uh, that is very similar to ACAP called the Conservation Excellence Grant back in 2019. I say the Pennsylvania Farm Bill, bill is the only state level funded farm bill in the nation uh, that was founded back then by Secretary Redding and the Wolf Administration. Uh, but that program has been extremely successful too with ag BMPs. Uh, we have a program for tax credits uh, called REAP. Resource Enhancement and Protection Program, uh, 13 million in tax credits uh, for BMPs and equipment, conservation tillage equipment, crimpers, mm -hmm. you know, no-till drills. Uh, but 60% of that 140 million in credits historically that we've awarded have gone toward equipment. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's a real need there because uh, you know that the program itself is uh, the first month we open it in the fiscal year. Uh, those credits are already obligated, and then we have to wait with applications until the next fiscal year for the next 13 million. We partner mm -hmm. strongly with NRCS through RCPP, EQIP, CSP. We've been very successful, uh, have a great working relationship with our federal partners. Uh, would just like to build on that, you know, with uh, with additional opportunities as as it relates to uh, soil health in the future. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you all so much. I, I'm just going to highlight a couple of other state examples. Um, like I said, so many that we could talk about on this panel today. Um, Washington State, I wanted to highlight that they also have a soil health partnership initiative called WASHI. Um, and hopefully folks can hear me because my, my camera is coming in a little choppy. But um, this is an innovative partnership that funds research, outreach and extension, and technical and financial assistance. Um, they have a new grant program called the Sustainable Farms and Fields Program, very new. They had 1.8 million to award and got over 2 million in application requests for that funding. Um, which is remarkable for a new program. Uh, I think my, my friends at state agencies <laughs> would agree. Um, and also New Mexico has a really innovative soil health program that they've been administering for four years now. Um, and they provide funding to lo through local government entities like Asaquias, Pueblos, through tribes, through other local entities to inclusively help producers adopt soil health practices in very regionally adapted and culturally appropriate ways. And they currently have a modest 1.1 million to award. And in fiscal year 23, they worked with 13 entities to provide funding to 38 farms. An admirable start with a lot of room for improvement, kind of similar theme that we're hearing. So um, final question from me for our panelists. Um, if you could just take a couple of minutes, you've already started to touch on it, um what could you achieve with more funding for your soil health programs what's your vision for the future and i know that our friends in minnesota have been undergoing some planning processes so maybe we'll start with you and then um, go to doug and jen oh well, sure yeah so well we would apply it where we're using um <clears throat> Federal funds right now and state and uh, private partnership funds, frankly. The, um, um, you know, when I look at our work in uh, our certification program, I've been talking about that today. Um, you know, we have on a quarterly basis when we check with the locals who deliver our program, there's usually about 300 open applications. So um, there's work to be done to, uh, to bring those applications to certification and uh, that costs some money. Um, and I think, uh, again, we'll take care of the labor on that, but we, you know, uh, the practices and the management changes that occur out there are very expensive. Farming is a very expensive business to begin with. And so agriculture conservation is going to be no different. It's an expensive undertaking in its right, own right as well. 
and so uh, those additional fundings will again um, through um, existing structures existing title two programs uh, most welcome um, the uh, another uh, point on the um, you know make it simple as can make it <laughs> as usable as it can be mm -hmm. can come in the door and get out to the field as quick as, as possible um, and then you know um, with you know our efforts around the equipment you know that mm -hmm. you know those that type of financial assistance doesn't exist in the farm bill now uh, certainly not in the way we're doing it um, that is something that um, you know it's just a tremendous demand out there we set our grants at a fifty thousand dollar max fifty percent max of whatever the cost is up to fifty thousand or you know if it's less it's just fifty percent but uh and that alone is still certainly showing the tremendous demand out there for getting that just in uh you know i'd say just a few weeks now we've had this this uh, experiment going and we, yeah. we see the demand is, is is outstanding so um the efforts to assist with that the public private partnerships are staying there with us we're you know, Land O'Lakes, Shutera, others are working mm -hmm. with us side by side in uh, in these efforts, uh, as the other companies and interest groups I've mentioned. So um, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, as you said at the outset, this is a unifying issue, and uh, we're all marching the same path. Thanks, Brad. Tom. Yeah. So uh, another effort that we're anticipating, as we we're as sort of alluded to earlier, the current legislative session in Minnesota, the governor's budget has a proposal of twenty-seven million dollars over the next biennium to go towards soil health programming in the state of Minnesota. And in addition, there's somewhere between twelve and fourteen million potentially coming out of our clean water fund going towards soil health initiatives. So we're on the cusp of having you know, a significant investment in soil health in Minnesota in some way, shape or form, pending all of the legislative outcomes, of course. I think we're having conversations uh, about how do we leverage that to first and foremost sort of create the infrastructure and systems that, that help landowners um, succeed and take a step. Um, you know, Jennifer's mentioned, we've talked about sort of the journey of, of, of working through soil health adoption, and there aren't a lot of people that go from sort of traditional tillage to a no-till system or to a strip-till system overnight. It's a, it's, a, it's a transition process, or even incorporating cover crops, or livestock for that matter. Um, and we want to be able to build that infrastructure, and by infrastructure, I mean having people there that, that they can trust. People trust from farmers and government don't always necessarily go hand in hand so there's recognition that trust is a really important factor and how do we work with people to support them in going through this process and again just sort of taking a step our one of our second goals with that process is going to be um, having discussions about leveraging federal funding so that we can take that money and make it go further in minnesota um, ironically just before this webinar i saw a calendar invite come up with with Troy Daniel, who's the state con for NRCS in Minnesota, that we're lining up to talk about positioning ourselves, hopefully, to leverage some of the farm bill things that we're talking about going forward, and the investments mm -hmm. on how we want to tie that together and how we can help deliver and pull some of that money to Minnesota. Um, big picture, long term, just paying for these sorts of things is probably not sustainable. Again, we're talking about millions of acres that are needed and millions of acres that are needed in an ongoing manner. So we want landowners first and foremost to feel good about the decisions they're making and feel good about potentially making these changes in their operations because if they feel good about it they're more likely to continue going forward without needing monetary assistance um, absolutely. and, and ab absolutely tying to that as well is the importance of just you know they don't all want money there some of them just want to be connected with landowners who are working mm -hmm. on these practices already to help set their equipment up right so that when they plant their crops their crops can succeed as opposed to trying to learn on the fly when you're planting tens hundreds thousands of acres um so there's a lot that's going on and hopefully more that we can leverage and more that we can do going forward all right thanks tom uh so next doug and then jen Briefly, what do you, what's your vision for the future with more? What, yeah, what more you yeah. Thank you, uh, Samantha. Yeah, just you know, touching on those programs that I mentioned before that we currently have. I mean, anything we can do to leverage additional funding for soil health using those uh, state and local investments that we've had. We have an amazing network of public-private partnerships, local organizations that are all working towards conservation here in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I just think if we could pull those groups together and uh, be able to bring in additional funding with a very 
you know, intentional focus on soil health, the timing is just right for that. Uh, I feel that in the State Conservation Commission, my organization, we could work with county conservation districts to provide more opportunities for training on the technical side of soil health to understand soil biology's role in nutrient cycling and soil structure and building soil organic matter. Um, we have a, a great network of county conservation district staff who I think would really benefit from those training opportunities. Uh, American Farmland Trust provided us with mini grants, which we distributed uh, to counties last year, two years ago, for uh, programs that are local that administer farmland preservation uh, easement purchase efforts. And that was so successful. And I think something like that, you know, even at a federal level would be great. Um, but just and also, you know, targeting our preserve farms for additional conservation investments in general. But uh, it all takes farmer buy in. And I think any type of education for the farming community and mentoring among the farming community would really be uh, worthwhile and also funding to help cover uh, the risk factor for the transition period or mm -hmm. some sort of resources or support for that transition would be useful. But it's it certainly is a good time for this conversation. So again, thank you. So many wonderful ideas coming from our state agency folks. Jen, bring us home. I'll try. My jaw's still on the ground for hearing all your guys' budgets. And it's just, I'm, <laughs> we're working with $4 million in that salary for staff and training dollars. And wow, I'm so envious. It's not even funny. Uh, so um, kind of just wrapping up what um, Brad said too. And um, so just the leveraging partnerships and those private dollars that would be wonderful we do some of that now because well we really need to to get conservation on the ground but more of that um and then the equipment gap that we talked a lot about that and but i think it's good because that's something that is really needed and just the i know brad touched on the cost to you but just for the farmer transition even as he said to go from a high voice so they can plant it um you know, at the row cleaners, that's not cheap. And so if we were able to have additional funds and sort of if it would be state not tied to NRCS, they have specific requirements, that would be one thing, the equipment. And they also thing that I would like to see is flexible seeding dates. So we struggle a lot with the farmers getting cover crop on um, in Indiana, they're large acres. Um, so it, it's really hard if they're not doing wheat, it's really hard for them to get the cover crops in on the time that they say that they're supposed to. Um, even our local districts, they're required to follow NRCS specs. So even if a farmer were to get local cost share money, they have to follow the same seeding dates and it gets, it's so hard to get within that particular time frame. Um, mm -hmm. The part that I liked about the RCVPs is we could be innovative. I would love to have some more innovation. For example, under the first, the 14, we had a uh, RCVP for the WLA, West Lake Area Basin 14, and gypsum was a practice that wasn't standard at the time, um, and it worked great. We have low mag fields, um, and so that became a practice that farmers could apply just under that RCVP umbrella. Um, mm -hmm. After some success, it's now, for Indiana, it's a regular practice. Um, the other thing that I would love to see is that to have additional money to work with our egg retailers. We've done a lot of um, social indicator surveys and the farmers really listen to their egg retailers. Um, they don't trust the, some of us, go figure, right? Um, and so <laughs> they definitely will get the advice from their egg retailers. And we've had some programs with, with them um, and we've seen success regarding the soil sampling or just promoting filter strips as well. Um, in the tiered system, I know Doug just mentioned that too, but that's something that we're starting to really look at. So it would be almost like a five year. Um, so the first year you would get, you know, 100% covered and we would slowly be um, mm -hmm. reduced as far as where you are in your soil health journey, um, covering mm -hmm. that risk factor a little bit, because that is a hurdle for mm -hmm. a lot of the farmers that we work with. Um, but I would, yeah. And then the other part I know with the soil health programs, the matching it sometimes, that would be a tricky part too for, for us a little bit. And I'm sure several other departments of ag too. So thank yeah. you, Samantha. Thank you all so much. I just wanna remind folks to drop your questions in the chat. I see a few in there. I'm gonna pivot quickly to Farm Bill and then we'll get to a couple of questions before we close out on time. Um, but before I do, you know, we're, we've heard from folks at different state agencies, some that have some generous funding, some with less generous funding. And I just wanna point out that there are states um, that uh, have 
begun to be more interested in investing in soil health that have programs set up and might even have agency staff to administer them, but no funding. So that would include Maine and Oregon. Um, and so having the existence of this um, match, so uh, we're, we're looking to create a, a farm bill program that, that provides matching funding for state and tribal soil health programs. And this has a couple of benefits. One is that um, it can build up on existing programs, help states realize their vision and goals for the future, um, and try innovative different approaches that really work for folks in their state. Um, and build off of their existing infrastructure with a little bit more flexibility to Jen's point. But it can also incentivize those states that are interested in investing, might struggle to find some of that funding to put more funding forward for their own approaches. And we're, we've been working alongside partners in DC and across the country, and we're asking for congressional support for this bold yet achievable and very timely, as Doug said, very timely moment to invest in a program like this. How often do we come across something that's bold yet achievable, that's unifying? Um, so we're really hoping to create this federal match for states and tribal soil health programs to build up on these local approaches. I believe my, um, my colleague Emily has put a link into the chat with a little bit more information, but we'll follow up by email with more information. This um, concept and program has been proposed by um, House representatives on both sides of the aisle in the last Congress, so it enjoys bipartisan support and interest. And just to make a few finer points, why we like this, leverages federal conservation dollars, supplements and fills gaps with NRCS programs, like equipment purchase is a big one, um, provide states the ability to provide more flexible, locally tailored assistance um, trust has come up, uh, figuring out ways for farmers to get information, not just cost share, but information and technical assistance that really works for them, um, providing some flexibility in the planting dates for cover crops, something that we've heard come up a lot, even streamlined. In Maryland, they offer cover crop assistance. Producers have said to us their program is refreshingly streamlined, takes just one visit into the office. In Virginia, we hear back within a month um, that we are, we're getting assistance, whereas they can be waiting um, for longer periods of time to hear back from NRCS. And this also helps states and tribes test out innovations that can be incorporated into future farm bills. This cover crop discount has been implemented by USDA for two years to great um, success and popularity across the country, supporting 10 to 12 million acres of cover crop planting at a low cost. Um, so final slide, AFT, like I said, we're working alongside many partners in DC and across the country and alongside leaders in Congress um, to uh, create this new program in the next Farm Bill to build up these state efforts and incentivize others to create programs of their own. I started off by saying soil health is a bridge builder. This is no exception. These are just an example of um, groups that support this uh, concept. And um, like I mentioned, FACA at the beginning, the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance, they also put this into their Farm Bill recommendations. Um, and before I get to the q and I just wanna point out that every Title II program that we have was once just an idea. It's just an idea of something timely and important to do. And I think that we have another example of something timely and bold yet achievable that we could do in this next Farm Bill. And so I hope that um, folks in Congress will work with us to accomplish this, um, to help producers improve soil health, build up their farm viability, resilience, um, reduce their risk exposure to droughts and floods that are becoming increasingly more common, while also improving water quality and even maybe mitigating climate change. So happy to get into further detail. We only have a few minutes for questions and answers. Um, and I'm not seeing many questions in the chat. Uh, have somebody saying Colorado has a, a really strong program? Absolutely. Like I said at the beginning, we could really have gone over <laughs> so many different state programs. And if my panelists want to come back on camera,
And we had a question about equipment purchase. Um, so for those that are investing in equipment purchase, have you used creative program structures to overcome the functional limitations of any state level procurement or anti-donation restrictions? If not, are there, are there limitations that you're finding with your equipment program that, um, or how is your, how are your equipment programs functioning? Maybe we should um, ask that question so that they really work for producers. Yeah, well, I'll jump in on that with the pilot that we're operating right now in Minnesota. The, um, I guess those specific elements I heard mentioned uh, were not issues <laughs> in, in our state, at least the, um, the issue for us has been um, really, uh, you know, how much money should be provided for equipment purchases. Like I said, we said that we would do no more than $50,000. We would do no more than half the cost. Um, whatever, it's a $3,000 expense, we'll only do half, that sort of thing, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it faces those challenges in terms of, uh, is that even enough to get a farmer to be able to access the equipment? Um, but we importantly include that um, Farmers may form formal co-ops. They just may form groups of growers to access pieces of equipment shared amongst themselves. Our local units of government are shown water conservation districts or tribes. They're all eligible to buy the equipment and use it for equipment sharing purposes. Um, didn't mention those earlier. I should have. That is an opportunity to get more people, to get more acres done. Uh, it's always a little bit of challenging. You know, everyone kind of wants to use it the same day. <laughs> But you know, it's we've all seen evidence of being able to have successful equipment sharing programs. So I think that we're eager about that, making sure, and specifically intentionally making sure that those applicants were were um, encouraged and uh, included in our in our grant program as well. Great. Any other folks want to chime in on that? If not, another question just came in. Great. So um, as agency staff, many of you mentioned partnerships with districts, uh, soil and water conservation districts, or with local organizations. Um, the question came in about what role grassroots organizations can play in moving forward program development. I know some of you have some stakeholder processes you're engaging in. Um, some of you partner with groups. Um, any ways that you see that folks can get more engaged and involved? I can take a stab at some of our programming too, or what we're anticipating for future. When I mentioned, um, you know, our, our future potential investments, talking about since the sort of the systems and infrastructure to support, I think grassroots organizations, I think small landowner groups and just sort of land or kind of farmer to farmer and peer groups are going to play a critical role in all of that. Uh, you know, as you mentioned and others have mentioned, and I, I sort of chided, you know, the, the the words of trust and government don't often go hand in hand when it comes to working with <laughs> landowners and farmers. So um, we need to earn that. Uh, mm -hmm. We can't just expect it to be given. We need to earn that through listening, through having seats at the table where we're not leading, but they're leading um, are all kind of critical components of that. And it, it, it goes both to the grassroots groups, but also uh, I think it was Jennifer that maybe mentioned also sort of some private industry opportunities to partner too, because that's where producers often go as a trusted resource. So finding ways to to connect the dots and encourage, you know, local soil and water conservation district staff to partner with and explore new avenues to bring landowners to the table and to listen uh, and provide resources to help is going to be really, really critical. Great. Thanks, Tom. So we're we're nearing the end. I'm going to pose one more question to this panel, and maybe Jen and Doug can start us off. Um, but before I do, I just want to thank our panelists so much for joining us. This was an excellent panel. I want to thank everybody who attended to listen and learn today so much for your time and attention. Um, I want to thank Emily Liss on AFT's staff for helping us run this webinar um, technologically. And um, I want to flag a few things that will cross many folks' inboxes. So um, soon AFT is going to release a white paper that highlights these and many other examples of approaches to support soil health at the state or local level. And we'll send that out to everybody. 
Um, later this year, AFT's Farmland Information Center is going to be releasing a study where they looked at soil health programs across the country, and many of you on this panel have spoken to those folks to share what y'all are working on. So we'll share that with everybody. And that memo that we put into the chat will um, we'll also share that with you all. And so my final question is, why now? Why is this the moment? Doug, I think that you've said a few times that this is such a ripe moment. Why is this the moment to invest in soil health programs at the state level? I mean, just, yeah, just to emphasize again, I, there seems to be so much momentum locally with, uh, when I say locally within counties and watershed organizations and conservation groups that we work with locally. I think Tom said it uh, very well. I mean, conservation all happens at the grassroots level. That's where farmers earn trust and, uh, we'll be able to get our what we need to accomplish working through local groups. And I just think there's so much momentum now here in Pennsylvania with both the Chesapeake Bay, which we're focusing so much on, and water quality, which also crosses over into soil health very heavily. Uh, but I just think riding on that momentum right now for us, uh, just because we, we see so much of it, is it makes it a perfect time. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Any final thoughts on why now? <laughs> For us, I, we feel like it's a generational shift going, happening kind of right now. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, and there's just a lot of opportunities to partnership and people are asking a lot of really good questions recently. Um, and so, and they want to make changes. They want to make sure that that soil is there for the next generation. Um, we've seen a definite uptake in um, a lot of the resources we have available and calling us. I just, it feels like it's just right now, it's the right time. Tom Brad, and I just offer, yeah, please. Yeah, please. no, I just offer. I think that uh, you know, it's not the only thing, but um, the demand for resiliency and be able to maintain your operations. I mean, soil health is critical in this respect, and it's something that's um, yes, at this time, as the growers are seeing it for themselves, they're experiencing for themselves the weird weather, as weird as it's been, and it's only getting weirder. <laughs> so we need those that armament on our on our soil in our in our management systems to to keep agriculture productive and, and proceeding in our, our state and our nation. Yeah, it's the last, I think, you know, the, the right time to invest and help anyone in soil health is when they ask the question. And and Jennifer alluded to it and, and Doug alluded to it and Brad talked about it and it's been throughout this is when a landowner walks in the door or asks a question in any room about what can they do to do something that moves in this direction, we want to be able to provide opportunities to help them do that. And it doesn't need to be money. It might need to be support. It might need to be answering questions. It might need, need to be connecting the dots. That's the right time to invest. And right now we're getting a lot of questions and we want to position ourselves to be able to help those people make decisions for their operation. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you all so much for your time. This was so much fun. Um, thank you everyone for joining and please don't hesitate to reach out with questions or needs as we move forward. Thank you. Bye everyone.